Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, welcome back on The Objective. Check out our website, ontheobjective.org, to stay up to date with all of the content that our team of partners and contributors is producing on a regular basis. I'd also recommend subscribing to our YouTube channel and following our Twitter feed. Just type in On The Objective, and we'll come up on both of those platforms. Back with us again today is Pastor David Lankford of The Voice of Evangelism. The website is www.thevoiceofevangelism.com. Head on over to the bookstore and check out the offerings there in terms of commentaries on Revelation, books on fasting, the New Jerusalem Bride. All of these things are extremely accessible and deep in terms of their explanations of important and critical scriptural issues. So, Thanks again to Pastor Langford for being here with us on The Objective again. Pastor, welcome back. If you wouldn't mind starting us off with a blessing, that would be tremendous. Absolutely, Stephen. I want to say thank you for allowing me to come and to share the Word of God, uh, because uh, as never before, we need a solid foundation to stand upon here in the time of the end. So let's invoke the Father's blessings upon the program today. Heavenly Father, we embrace your august power, might, and strength. We humble ourselves under your mighty hand, Lord God, not so much that we would be exalted in due time, but that we might be covered and protected and led in this nefarious hour in which we are living in. Father, I pray that you would touch every mind, every spirit, and every ear today to hear what the Spirit of the Lord has to say unto the churches. Father, make the path plain. Help us to see the way. Lead us every step that we take, Father God. Moses would not go without you, Lord, and neither will we. Now we just ask you to anoint my brother and I today as we attempt in our, in our humanity, in our, in our fragility, O oh God, to expound on the riches of Christ, touch everyone's home and family and marriage, bless this nation, touch us to be salt and to be light in this world, Father, and we'll give you the praise for it all, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you, Pastor Langford. And I wanted to start off with the discussion of the idea of unity and division. These are important dynamics that we're seeing in our generation, particularly inside of the church. And so just a quick reading from Psalm 133. This is a set of verses that often gets pointed to in terms of a discussion of unity. So I'll read out of the King James here, uh, just a three-verse psalm, Psalm 133. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments, as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. So, Pastor Langford, in... In other places in Scripture, in the New Testament, in Revelation, the people of uh, Christ are called out of things, and there are various points in the epistles where you uh, establish a procedure for uh, correcting someone who is within the body, and then at a certain point, there's, uh, there's the indication that fellowship should be broken. And one of the things that I've been praying for recently uh, and continuously is discernment, because we have to make important decisions, and indeed, every decision that we make is important in the eyes of God. We're going to be held accountable for all of it. And so, how do we balance these things, and how do we grow in our understanding? understanding, uh, because clearly we can go too far in either direction if we're not taking the whole counsel of God into account and applying the scriptures uh, judiciously. So do you have any uh, advice or counsel or other scriptures that we should look at when we're trying to make these sorts of decisions? At at what point should we prioritize unity? At at, at what point should we prioritize uh, sort of doctrinal purity? Where, Where does that Where does that line show up, and how should we best navigate these tricky waters where we see all sorts of different uh, influences in terms of the way people think, not just about the world, but about Scripture itself? Well, Stephen, there is a great demand on unity in the body of Christ. Uh, Paul well said in Ephesians 4, verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, the word endeavor there means you've got to labor, you've got to press, you've got to agonize. You've got to do something that takes labor. It takes labor 
endeavoring, that's what the word means, labor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, the unity can only be kept by the Spirit. There's no other way for you to be where you are and me to be where I am and us to be unified except it first be by the Spirit of God. That's why I have to drop on down there to verse 6. Paul said, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Um, we must have the unity, but the unity only comes through the Spirit. And then the, the, the unity, as it comes through the Spirit, it is bound together by the peace of God. Philippians 4, 7, the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. This is one of the things that we're lacking in the church world today. We don't have the true unity because we don't have the same spirit. Paul said in Romans 8, verse 9, If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. It is absolutely imperative that I have the spirit of Christ in my life. If the spirit of Christ is not in my life, then I'm told I do not have Christ. Now, I know that's very hard and difficult for some people to understand, but that is the pure, uh, unadulterated truth. And so we're living in an hour when people are willing to uh, break unity uh, over a spiritual disagreement. But here's where the, 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 the demarcation is when it involves sin. No one has a right to change the Word of God, make it palatable, where anyone can live any lifestyle, any way, and then profess that they have the same spirit that we have if we have the spirit of Christ. That's why they're called charlatans. That's why they're called pretenders. But, but the key note here is the spirit of God. Now, this is why when we have the spirit of God, he is able to lead us, to guide us, and to direct us. Some years ago, when I was pastoring in Charlotte, North Carolina, I was preaching one Sunday morning, and uh, as I was preaching, the Holy Spirit suddenly checked my heart. He checked my heart. And when he checked my heart, he said, there's someone in this congregation contemplating adultery with another person. I suddenly stopped preaching, and I said, there's someone in here, or actually two of you, you're contemplating a, uh, a, a rendezvous, you're, you're planning to get together, and it's an adulterous act, it's an adulterous affair, and God loves you and says, you better not do it. And I went right back to preaching my message, and I wasn't even on sin, but, but, but suddenly the Spirit checked me again. And I stopped and I said, we're going to know in two or three days whether I'm a false prophet or not. Now, I don't declare to be a, a prophet by no means, but the utterance was prophetic. So after the service that Sunday morning, I was in the lobby shaking people's hands, and a brother walked up to me, and he said, do you have just a minute, Pastor? Could I step into your office? And I said, sure. We stepped in my office. He started weeping uncontrollably. And he said, I and this woman in this church, he named her name. He said, we're, 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 we're planning to get together. We were, we were uh, uh, calling. We were talking, meeting in places. We hadn't done anything, but we were setting this up for an eventual uh, adulterous affair. And, and I said, well, brother, you need to thank God. He loves you so much to warn you and to save you from committing a sin that is grievous to the body of Christ. So I prayed with him, and so we walked back out of the office, and he went home. Well, the Sunday night, a gentleman came into my church. He was, he was there that Sunday morning. He says, Pastor, do you have a, a minute or two? Can we step in your office and, and speak? I said, sure. Stepped into my office. Neither one of us had even had a chance to sit down. He looked at me, and he said, you lied this, this morning. I said, pardon me? He said, you lied this morning. I said, what do you mean? He said, the, God didn't tell you somebody in this church was about to commit adultery. He said, you made that up. And I was stricken with grief. And I looked at him. I said, sir, right exactly the same place where you're standing. A brother stood this morning after the worship service and admitted to me he was attempting with another lady in this church to commit adultery. And I said, here's what I want you to do. Get your wife, get your children, and your grandchildren, and leave this church. The day that you believe your pastor is a liar would feign spirituality in the pulpit 
and make a statement of that magnitude, you have absolutely no confidence in me whatsoever. And therefore, I don't have confidence in you because you are underlying beneath all of this, going to go out here and tell people I lied if you haven't already done it. But I said, the truth is, I did not lie. And I said, that's why the Spirit checked me the second time when I made the statement, we'll know in two or three days whether I'm a false prophet or not. I said, God already knew your heart, brother. He knew you were going to confront me with this issue. And the truth is, the man admitted right where you are. And so this is where the church sometimes becomes weak and anemic, unwilling to take that stand, unwilling to call sin what sin is. And and here's the problem, uh, Stephen. We become unequally yoked. You know the passage as, as well as I know the passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? Now, when most people read that verse or quote that verse, they're, they're looking at the church versus the world. That's not true. What Paul is talking to us about here is unequally yoked together with someone who does not believe like you believe. We're not talking about Hindu, Islam, Christianity, Judaism. We're talking about believing and embracing the Scriptures. I say Genesis 18 and 19 and Romans 1 is still apropos today about same-sex marriage. It's a sin. But they'll come along and say, no, that's, that's changed. God does not feel like that. I heard one uh, uh, theologian from Harvard or Yale, I forget which one it was, he said, we don't even know what the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was. Yet 3,500 years later, they still carry the same stigma, sodomy or sodomites. But yet he has the audacity as a theologian to say, we don't know what the sin was. Well, this is why it's such a danger to remain unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I'm not I, the, just the, the, uh, the rank and file sinner out here in the world. I'm not yoked up with him. My job is to witness to him. My job is to tell him about Jesus. He doesn't know Jesus. He doesn't have a relationship with Jesus. So in Paul, of course, the epistles, let me say this as well. The epistles are written to the churches, the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That is written to all the world. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But the epistles are more distinct, and they are more pointed. They are pointed at you and I. We are believers, and so it's like we're in school. Now that we're in, we're in the church, we're in the body, now we need to be taught. We need to learn how to grow. We need how to learn to deal with particular sins that might come into the church. And, of course, we witnessed that in the First Corinthians chapter 5 when there was a fornicator. In First Corinthians 5 and 1, Paul said, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. So most theologians believe it was a stepson who was committing a, a, a fornication with his uh, stepmother. And, and, and Paul said this kind of fornication is not even common among the Gentiles. Well, that shows you these were uh, Jews being converted to Christianity. And so Paul says you've not dealt with this. You've not dealt with this in the manner that you need to deal with it. So he goes down there in verse uh, 6. He said, your glorying is not good. Know you not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Leaven is nothing but yeast, fermentation. You take a pinch of uh, leaven and you put it into a a, a dough uh, that you're going to make, say, uh, 25 biscuits. Though you cannot see the, the, the dough rising, that fermentation is taking place in that lump. It is so small, so minuscule, you can't see it with the natural eye. But put it on a, a, a camera, uh, get the lens very close, and then speed up or accelerate the time frame, and you can see it actually happening. But it's not, it's, it's not visible to the natural eye. So then Paul says, purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that's, that's whatever that sin is, that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. That's, see, leaven always represents sin. And so when they ate unleavened bread at the Passover, uh, that was a type of the body of Christ. There was no sin in Christ. So then Paul becomes very pointed in his uh, disposition here to the church there at Corinth. 
And he says in verse 10, Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out into the world. What does that mean? Paul said, you don't run out here into the world, and you don't judge every drunkard, every covetous, every extortioner, every idolater. You don't run out there and take, and take care of that. I'll, I'll take care of that, God says. I'll take care of them. You take care of the church. You take care of my body. And then he goes on in verse 11, but now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such a one, do not eat. Paul forbid them to even go out and have dinner with the brother who's living in sin. Why? Because you're unequally yoked now. You're embracing someone or something that is evil, vile, and wicked, yet that person continues to say, but wait a minute, I'm a brother. I'm a brother. If that is a true brother, they will repent. They will acknowledge their sin. Instead of glorying, magnifying the sin, they will acknowledge the sin and say, I need restoration. I need help. I've let my life get out of order. And Here's where people in the church now gets offended. They get offended, they become arrogant, they become self-righteous, and then they're, they're the ones. People need to understand this. They are the ones that is taking the unity away from the body of the church. It's not the Christian. It's the fact that Satan is trying to put sin. Satan is trying to put leaven into the church through that person. Satan will use anybody he can, even up to a pastor. He will use anyone to disrupt the continuity and the fluidity in the church, the body of Christ. So here's where we have to be very strong and uncompromising. And I know sometimes that's hard, but that's why leaders have to be strong. Paul said, though I'm not there in person, bodily, he said, I'm there in spirit. My spirit has discerned what's going on in the church. So this is the hour in which we've come to, because you can live any way. I, I just, somebody sent me an article last week. There's some young woman, I want to say in the state of Massachusetts, I'm pretty sure I'm correct there, she's into witchcraft, but she declared she was a Christian witch. She's only trying to help people find the way to God. And I thought, are you kidding me? Even Paul in Galatians chapter 5 addresses witchcraft. But she has Bible verses. She has Bible scriptures. And, and I'm going to say this. I don't say this to offend anyone. This is why I stay away from other versions of the Bible. The more you keep uh, diluting the sting, the bite, the conviction, every time you write a new version of the Word, you lose a little something. Uh, what we have today in the King James is called transliteration. It's not translation, it's transliteration. We're translating, literally, the Latin Vulgate, the Greek, the Greek Septuagint, uh, the Syriac, the Masoretic text. These are the, this is how we got the Bible. But here's what they've done, Steve. They've now taken what we have as a Bible, and now they're rewriting it. And I, I, I see versions sometimes grazing the Christian television channels, um, acronyms, I have no idea what they are because I, I just don't go there. And I'm not condemning anyone that has a new King, King James Version Bible or something like that. But we have to be careful because they take away those very stringent, uh, outspoken act, acts of sin. They, 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 they're very pointed into King James. They don't, the King James Version does not, uh, you know, make it very palatable. Uh, he, he hits you hard with this, this truth. And that's where the convicting power is, is in the Word of God. And, and, and so this is where it takes the leadership of the Spirit to say, how do we deal with this? This is why the church, when the church has a church problem, the elders, that's why elders are so important in the church. Stephen was an elder, but he was full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost, the Bible said. Uh, but he was also martyred for Christ's sake because of his testimony. So we need to understand there is a fine line there of unity slash uniformity. We can all have on the same uniform. A football team can have the same uniform on, but there's dissension in the huddle. They're not all in agreement. 
One says, we need to do this. Another says this. Another says that. They're, they're not in unity, and they end up losing for the most part because they're not uh, in unity, believing this is the best method to go. The old saying, if we live together, then we die together. But Satan is a master at dividing us through many methods. Well, we absolutely do see all of those dynamics at play, and it makes it more and more difficult for us to understand what to do. And if anything, it should push us towards a a conclusion that we don't know what to do in our own strength and in our own mind. And so it should lead us into wholly trusting a holy God and to rely on him rather than to lean on our own understanding. But if we want wisdom about these sorts of things, we can go to Proverbs and elsewhere in the scripture. One of the things that sort of struck me as you were talking about the, the contention and, and people coming into into your office and, and bringing a reproach to you, uh, there's there's a certain notion that we should be hands off and just not not address and not confront and and all of these different things and people will even point to uh, different different places in proverbs particularly where uh, where it's talking about the tongue and and the power therein and how we should how we should use our our speech and our words in proverbs 15 uh, verse 1 a soft answer turneth away wrath but grievous words stir up anger and then in verse 4 a wholesome tongue is a tree of life but perverseness therein is a is a breach in the spirit and so people can and do it seems to me apply these kind of verses or they would have the potential to apply these verses sort of generally but there is a time as you mentioned for a for a stronger word in terms of calling out sin in particular not just a uh, not just a disagreement about where to where to go to eat or other things like that uh, other kind of more trivial matters but when we're talking about things of eternal import and eternal consequence then you can't just say all right i'm going to give a soft answer to all of this because you're actually giving place um giving place to the enemy and even in uh, even in trying to understand the fullness the fullness of a matter in Proverbs 18, uh, verse 17. This is something that I, you know, I I go through. I go through Proverbs about uh, about once a month, reading the the proverb, um, the chapter in Proverbs that matches with the with the day. And so, you know, I've been doing that for several years. And verse 17 in Proverbs 18 uh, just stood out to me recently in a way that I hadn't seen it before. Um, the King James reads, He that is first in his own cause seemeth just, but his neighbor cometh and searcheth him. And for me, this is paralleling the idea that we need to hear the whole uh, the whole of a matter, and, and particularly what's been happening in terms of the political situation and everything else, it, it, it means that, or, or the way that it stood out to me was, there's this, the, the initial presentation seems right, but we have to wait until the full balance of, uh, of evidence is taken in, and whether this is something that we're dealing with personally or something at a, at a grander scale as a nation, it just seems like people are extremely quick to pull out um, either either a proof text from scripture or something else and just have a tendency to to let to let too many things go and on the other hand there's you know obviously a kind of choleric temper and other sorts of things that would be over the top in terms of applying it too broadly so again it's a question of where is where is this line and how will we know exactly how to enforce it and isn't it isn't it fair pastor to say that in our in our own mind, we can have a tendency to to change those lines or to or to sort it out as we see fit, and so it's only a complete reliance on the Spirit of God and on and on the Scripture that will give us the discernment that we need to deal with these kind of situations. It just seems like there's so much uh, there's so much chaos and there's so much uh, doctrinal disbursement in in various kind of considerations and denominations and everything else like that that if we're not being led by the spirit of god then even the sort of banquet of of choices alone is going to mean that we're going to end up being led in the led in the wrong direction is that a fair statement oh absolutely and um you know as you were talking about reading the psalm that's very tremendous uh discipline and mindset that you possess there and uh, reading a proverb, a chapter of Proverbs every every day of the month, because you know, that takes care of all of 31. 
But as you were talking, uh, I, I thought about there's a proverb, Proverb thirteen ten. Only by pride cometh contention. And we have to look at the circumstance. We have to look at the situation and ask ourselves, who is possessing the pride? See, I, that Sunday morning, I, what I said was not prideful. I was trying to be led by the Holy Ghost. But the man who come and made the false accusation was the man that possessed the pride. Proverb twenty-eight twenty-five: he that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife. Well, I, I thought about it years later. What, what if I... What if that was my flesh? And I, I just said that. Um, what was the purpose in attacking me? To demean me, castigate me, to just, just, just literally find fault? I mean, we all know the easiest thing in the world to do is to find fault. Uh, I can look at someone's hair and say, I don't like the way your hair looks. I don't like your part. I don't like your curl. I don't like the wave. Um, that, that, that's carnality, see? And so... When, when Solomon there in Proverbs 13, 10 said, only by pride cometh contention. So that, that, that is a warning right there immediately. This person or this situation and their attempt to defend it is because they're pride and they're arrogant. Uh, the Bible says, Proverbs 13, 12, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil pride and arrogancy. Uh, excuse me, that was 8 and 12, Proverbs 8, 12. I'll get it right here in a minute. 813. Uh, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy. Those are the three things, evil, pride, and arrogancy. Pride and arrogancy are somewhat synonymous. So uh, this is where the, the, the strong man, the strong hand, like Moses, was a man of meekness. Numbers 12, 3 said he was the meekest man upon the face of the earth. But meekness is not weakness. You know, sometimes when you display a loving, affectionate, tender disposition in dealing with sin, people will try to run all over you. You know, I, I've, I've seen that many times, uh, 27 years of pastoring. Uh, you always have those in the church that feel they're, they're comfortable with you, the pastor. Well, if you have more than one pastor in the church, a senior pastor. You can't only have one senior pastor. If you have more than that, you have a, a, an aberration. You have a two-headed monster. And I had a guy, uh, same same church years ago. Um, uh, he he went and got his credentials, and uh, he come to me and he said, "Now I'm equal with you." And I said, "No, you're not." I said, "I'm still the pastor." He said, "No, I'm equal with you." And I said, "That's my pulpit." And I will put in there who I will, whether it's you or somebody else, or if I don't put you in there. He said, no. He said, that's God's pulpit. I said, okay. See, just full of contention. I said, okay, here's what we're going to do Sunday morning. We're going to go into the sanctuary. We're going to sit down at 11 o'clock. And I said, we're going to sit there, and we're going to wait till God comes and speaks in that pulpit. And I said, you know what's going to happen? He said, Yeah. Nobody's going to show up. I said, that's right, Till I get up and go to the pulpit. I, he said, I said, you know why? Because God has made me the, the pastor. I'm the shepherd. Now, the shepherd is not always right. He's not without fault. He, that's why I had, always had a church and pastor's council. I'd bring those seven men in because the Bible says, seek you out seven men full of the Holy Ghost to administrate the affairs of the church. I, and I'd, I'd get me a council and um, have them say, listen, let's talk about everything that's going on in the church building program, Christian school, TV ministry, radio ministry, everything we're doing. And, and so don't sit there and be a yes man to me. I want to hear your honest opinion because you're going to see things that I'm not going to see. And I learned that early on as a, as a young pastor. Uh, I took the church of Charlotte with eight people. and six months, we were already running over 100. And I wanted to remodel the old sanctuary. I wanted to take down the, shan the, the existing lights, put chandeliers up, put new carpet, et cetera, et cetera. One of the older gentlemen, my senior, spoke up and said, Pastor, at the rate we're growing, we're going to be building a new sanctuary uh, church facility soon. Why would we want to remodel that? And I could have got offended and said, well, you just don't want to work with me. But I realized the wisdom. I took that church in, in November of 1986 and I had built a new sanctuary, and we moved in it October 1989. In three years, we took in 500 members in a period of three years. My point is, I could have been offended and said, well, you know, that guy don't want to work with me. 
and, and, and looking back, he was so correct because that existing sanctuary that we had ultimately became our high school for our high school students. And you didn't need chandeliers in there. You, you didn't need new carpet in there. Uh, so this is where people get in error when they don't take the time to listen. You know, we, we, I hear you, you hear me in this interview, this program today. But are we listening to what each other is saying? You know, and I've, and I've been guilty of this, and I'll, I'll, I'll take the flack for that. I have so much on my mind at times, somebody will come to me and approach me and start talking to me, and I'm still thinking about something else. But I'm hearing what they said, but I'm not listening because I've already got something else on my mind, and they hit you upside the head real quick with a statement. I learned that in pastoring. Uh, People catch you off guard and say, can we start this program in the church? And you look real quick and say, well, yeah, go ahead. And all of a sudden you have a bunch of church problems. Well, then you learn to say, whoa, 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 whoa. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go home and look at your idea and evaluate it for a couple weeks. I may bring it to the church council and let them look at it because I learned there's safety in the multitude of council. And so before we even react, and that's one of my great messages I preach, when I say great, not that I'm a great preacher, is whether are, are you reacting or are you responding? A reaction is a scientific term. For every action, there's a reaction. Take a hammer, hit an anvil, the hammer will automatically bounce back. That's a reaction. A response is when you ruminate, you meditate, you thoroughly examine the situation. You just don't react and say, yeah. You say, let me pause and think about this for a while. It may be a day. It may be two days. It may be a week. It may be a month. But reactionary responses always get us in trouble. You know, unless you're trying to deflect a rock coming at your eye and you put your hand up, that's great. That's good. But when it comes to dealing with the church, the body of Christ, uh, marital problems, or whatever the case might be, you cannot react. You must stop. And while I'm on that subject, and I brought that up, let me say this to every married couple listening today. If you want a better marriage, you want a better home, you want a better environment in your home, husbands, Take the time and the leadership to pray with your wife. I was in a conference almost four years ago in Dallas, Texas, and I was working the altars on Friday night, and I turned to this couple, and the Spirit of God checked my heart. I said, sir, do you pray with your wife? And he dropped his head. He said, no. I said, well, keep on, uh, start praying with her. And I kept on praying with other people. There's probably 400-some people in the altar. So the next morning I preach on, Sunday morning I preach on repentance. And the altars filled up all over the the auditorium. And I was rushing off the pulpit after the service to go change clothes. We baptized 253 people that morning after the worship service. But I was attempting to get off the stage, and this couple walked up to me, and the brothers looked at me. He said, sir, I need to speak to you. And I said, sure, go ahead. I'm in a hurry. He said, when you asked me last night, Did I pray with my wife? He said, the reason I could not answer you was because I was committing adultery. And he said, I've asked God to forgive me this morning in the altar. I've asked my wife to forgive me, and and God has forgiven me of my sins and reconciling our marriage. Now, as I said, I didn't know why the Spirit prompted me to say to him, do you pray with your wife? See, God knew why. And at that moment, the Holy Spirit began to deal with him about where he was. And then, of course, next, the next morning I preached on, 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 on repentance. That was my message, repentance. And so my point is we never know how God's using us. And God does that many times because he, he gets the glory. We don't get the glory. So I want to encourage husbands, be the man of God, step up to the plate, uh, get your wife by the hand, kneel by your bed, whether it be in the night, in the morning, whenever, and pray together. That will keep your marriage so strong, and the devil won't have an opportunity to get in there through, through another person. Uh, Satan's always seeking an entry point, and he, of course, goes to the leakest, weakest link in the chain to attempt to do that. So husbands, be the man of God. Step up to the plate. Take your wife by the hand and pray with her. When my wife and I are traveling in conferences and things, it's nothing unusual for me and her to pray three and four times a day together. 
because I want the Holy Spirit to protect us and give me the mind of God in what I'm doing. Uh, if we don't do that, this is where that divisiveness, and, and, and let me say this, this is where it begins in the home. If a church is having division, you can rest assuredly in that home there's a type of division. Before there was ever a church, there was a home, Adam and Eve's home, and Satan infiltrated it and destroyed it and has caused chaos ever since then. So husbands, be the man of God, uh, step up to the plate, and take that leadership. Your, life, your wife will love you more for that than you'll ever know because she sees uh, you as her covering. You are her protection. Uh, she's your helpmate. She came from your rib. She came from your side. She was joined to you on your wedding day. She was joined to you. You weren't joined to her. She was joined to you. That's why she takes your name. So cover her, and you'll be surprised. You'll be amazed at how much God will bless you. And that will keep uh, division out of the church because it'll start somewhere and then try to find its way into the body of Christ. Amen, Pastor. And I can second that because I know firsthand the results of uh, praying in terms of getting to the getting to the root of things and dealing with any conflict or tension, which is bound to come up in in terms of uh, any marriage at, at a variety of different levels. If there is prayer and the seeking of God's face for discernment and for um, and for forgiveness and to avoid any bitter roots coming up, then you can stand strong and on the firm foundation of Christ and not allow this uh, sort of foothold to come into your home. And it's absolutely critical that you do that just because a small thing that isn't addressed will eventually become a big thing, a major thing, an item of, uh, of sin. Some of these really challenging circumstances that people find themselves in are the result not of, uh, not of one climactic uh, event, but rather a steady drip and, and drop of difficult circumstances that go unaddressed, even small things things over the course of many years. And so we have to be surrendered to the Holy Spirit to uh, allow uh, God to search our hearts and to continue transforming us into into his image and into the character uh, of Christ. We have to be his representatives and he deserves proper representation and unfortunately in many scenarios he's not getting the the representation that he deserves but i thank god for uh, his forgiveness and for his long suffering uh, towards us and god wants strong marriages particularly i mean all the time but particularly now when marriage as an institution is under threat and less prioritized i'm i'm 30 years old so as a as a millennial people are uh, putting off putting off marriage uh, not prioritizing children and so the the effect on the runaway from biblical values and morality has expanded to even these kind of decisions where people uh, are 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 choosing to do different things with their life than than being led by God into these circumstances but again like in dealing in dealing with these conflicts and dealing with division versus unity a marriage is certainly uh, supposed to be unified and it is uh, an important responsibility knowing that if you're married uh, if you're if you're the man, if you're a husband, then you are a leader and you are accountable for the spiritual state of your household. And that means you have an incredibly important uh, role to play and an incredibly important responsibility. You're going to be held accountable for the spiritual state of affairs in your household. And unfortunately, Pastor, I just do, I just don't think that people treat that sort of responsibility seriously. I think it's because of having outsourced our our Christianity to the quote unquote professional Christian class, um, we we sort of don't take ownership and, and responsibility of it uh, for ourselves the way the way that we should. It's up to each individual. And so for me, it's it's critically important to acknowledge the uh, the sacred nature of that role and understanding that God has called all of us to occupy 
positions. And regardless of the position we're in, we have to occupy it according to scripture and according to the resources that God will give us. And if we understand that role and we cry out to God for the resource to fill it properly, he's faithful to give us what we need, the giftings, the sensitivities, and and everything. So uh, what do you make of this notion, Pastor Langford, that uh, the that leadership is something that everyone needs to uh, have a taste of, particularly uh, particularly in the home as the head of household, as a spiritual head of household, as a, as a, as a husband. Uh, and, uh, and why do you think we don't t- tend to take that as seriously as it deserves? Well, because we have such liberal mindsets uh, in America today. And um, I would encourage everyone, and I know this is going to upset it will upset some in your listening audience. I don't say it, I don't do it, to upset people. But I see the spirit of Jezebel uh, that's trying to overtake this nation. And on uh, the 29th of this month, I'm posting a video. It's entitled, Women Assassins. Women Assassins. Now, during the Judge Kavanaugh hearing, and I don't mean to get political on you, but I want to point out some things here. During Judge Kavanaugh's hearing, you had two com- you had one committee, partially Democrat, partially Republic. On the Republican side, there were no women judging Brett Kavanaugh. On the Democratic side, you had four women, very caustic, very abrasive, very demeaning, very condescending. Now, one of the signs of the last days is in Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12, which says children will oppress and women will rule. The the video I want the people to watch is from Mark chapter 6, Herodias. That was Herod's wife, who was first Philip's wife. And so John the Baptist preached, it is not lawful for for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias... She had a quarrel, the Bible said a quarrel, against John the Baptist. And this quarrel led to his execution. Now, she was having this quarrel. The word quarrel there in the Greek means a conflict um, uh, against someone. So it was, it was more than just a disagreement of verbiage. It was a, it was a disagreement of, 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 of the Spirit of God, the Word of God. And so the Bible said she sought for a way to kill John, But she didn't have it. There there was no means, no method for her to do what she wanted to do. That's why this, I exegeted that whole passage of Scripture there in Mark 6. I I can't do it in in two hours or whatever time we have here today, an hour or whatever. But the Bible says she sought for a means. She sought for a method to uh, to kill him. Uh, But she could not, the Bible says. But then it says, a convenient day arose. And what day was that? That was Herod's birthday. And so they're having this birthday party, and I'm, I'm certain that Herod and all of his kings and lords and captains were drunk. And so Salome, who was Philip and Herodias' daughter, not Philip, I mean not Herodias and Herod's daughter, but Philip and Herodias' uh, daughter. And so she comes in, Salome comes in. And she danced before Herod, the Bible says, and it pleased him. And I'm not going to elaborate on that, but I think you understand what that phrase means. And pleased him, and them that sat with him. So he's drunk, she dances a very licentious dance, and she seduces him. And so he speaks out before all of these men. He says, whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto half of my kingdom. What does she do? Salome runs to her mother, and she says, what should I ask? She said, ask for John the Baptist's head on a charger. So when she comes back, the Bible said she straightway came right back in with haste. She said to the king, I want John the Baptist's head on a charger. And for his oath's sake, he made an oath, he made a vow. He had to kill the man of God, but it was the woman assassin They got the convenient time, found a way to do this, and she did this. And Jerome says when the the, the, the executioner brought John's head back in on a platter uh, that Herodias pulled his tongue out, and she drove a long, large needle through his tongue. Now, why was she doing that? She was hating the message 
She was hating the truth. Now, m many would make this more political than it is. It wasn't political. It was spiritual. He was telling Herod and Herodias, you're living in adultery. You can't do this. Some people believe that Herodias may have been Jewish. And she knew the Mosaic law. She knew it was against the law. Not political law, not uh, governmental law, but God's judicial law. And so this hatred. So the Lord's been dealing with me uh, about what's coming. Uh, can you imagine if, if Nancy Pelosi becomes Speaker of the House again? What will happen to our nation? The things that Donald Trump has tried to accomplish? She said she's going to deal with his manhood. You, 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 that spirit is, is almost frightening, and I'm pleading, and I'm praying, and I'm begging God, and I'm asking every listener, please don't let that happen to us. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. I promise you, if she gets control of the United States Congress, you'll see disarray for two consecutive years. You think this has been bad, these first two years of the Trump administration? If, if she gets in control... I don't believe we can fathom the disarray that will be in this nation. And so we have to be careful. And again, God, I hope no one thinks I'm attacking women, I'm a misogynist, I'm a male chauvinistic pig, or anything like that. I'm just telling you, Jezebel, Ahab wanted Naboth's vineyard. He said, I'll buy it, I'll trade your land for it. Naboth said, no, it's my inheritance. God gave me this land. What does Jezebel do? She has him assassinated. This spirit is becoming prevalent, and we know character assassination is terrible, but, but, but it's going to get worse. And, and I'm concerned, and, and you're, you're dead on target, Stephen, with unity, the right kind of unity, the right cohesiveness. And, and, and people say, oh, you're just being judgmental. You're just being hard. No. For weeks, God has churned in my spirit these scriptures in my heart and telling me, here's what's coming if you don't pray. You're going to see these things happen. And, 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 and regretfully, those who are not spiritual will, well, he's just hateful. He's just, he's just condescending. No, it's, it's not about the person. It's about the spirit, the spirit. And so the greatest prophet, John, Jesus said, among them that are born among women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. And, and, and this woman, Herodias, had him killed. Because he was preaching righteousness, preaching the truth. And so when she found the convenient day, it was, a, it was an opportunistic time, she seized it. And the devil was plotting this because he was trying to stop. And, of course, he did stop John the Baptist. He stopped him in his tracks. So I want to encourage people to really pray. And husbands, be, be the man of your home. Be a leader. Uh, every, every man of God that lives right, honors his wife, she will love you. She will submit to you. She, she, your wife will want to serve you in, 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 in the capacity of a, of a wife and, and not contention and not strife. But husbands, you have to love your wife even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That's a lot of love and a lot of giving, and regretfully, men don't possess that spirit today. Well, I'm right there with you, Pastor Langford. It is a, a troubling kind of situation that we find ourselves in, but we also have the answer in Jesus Christ and our instructions in Scripture. And it's incredibly important that we go directly there and to get good counsel and everything else like that. And so in the final moments that we have here, Pastor, could you offer uh, any final words of advice and encouragement? Obviously, we're dealing with a critical a critical time and with a political decision to make. My, my prayer, of course, is that God wouldn't allow evil to come to power and that he would give us leaders who would make the right kind of decisions uh, for Jesus's righteousness and that we would have uh, godly leadership all across all across the land and that we would see revival and and repentance and restoration and a dealing with the the manifold sins as a as a country that we have uh, been that we've been privy to uh, by allowing them to take place abortion and uh, war and and everything but uh, any in the in the waning moments here, Pastor. Any final words of encouragement and advice for our audience who may be looking around at the world and and extremely troubled by what they see? Well, if we do our part, God will do His part. And and I've been admonishing everyone 
vote two things. If you go if you go to vote, and I pray that everyone will, that's your responsibility, your civil responsibility and duty. Vote your convictions and vote the word of God. Uh, uh, Proverb fourteen thirty four: Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach unto any people. If we will do the right thing, right, doing the right thing is righteousness. That's the root word of righteousness is right. If we will do the right thing, and I don't care what it is, step, stopping and helping your neighbor fix a flat tire, it doesn't matter. That's righteousness. That's doing the right thing. If we had more of that, uh, we'd see a greater uh, conciliatory spirit in, in our nation. But people aren't willing to do the right thing. They'll attack you while you're eating. They'll attack you while you're shopping, while you're walking through the airport. It's, it's, it's pure evil. And, you know, I, I see a man attempting to do what's right, and he's castigated to no end for just doing the right thing. Here's, here's 7,000 people coming from the southern border, n- knowing that they're breaking the law. And, and, and they want this. The spirit behind this is evil, and they're calling evil good and good evil. So I just want to encourage people, if you'll obey the word of God, and if you'll be led by the Spirit of God, your life will flourish. That doesn't exempt you from problems, from perils, dangers, tolls, and snares. But if you do the right thing, you will have God's blessing, and that blessing will spill over into our nation. It rains on the just and the unjust. When the just pay the price, even the unjust receive the temporal blessings. They're not eternal. They're just temporal. But we have the eternal blessing also with the temporal blessing. So I want to encourage everybody, just just do the right thing, Stephen. Well, amen to that, Pastor. And thank you again for your time here with us on The Objective. Uh, We'll bring the episode to a close now. I'm your host, Stephen Menking. Our guest has been Pastor David Langford of The Voice of Evangelism. The website there is thevoiceofevangelism.com. Definitely check that out in terms of all of the content, the books and the media, everything that's available there, powerful teachings and important words uh, that we need for our spirits, for our nourishment in this pivotal time. Our website is on theobjective.org. I'd also encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow our Twitter feed. Just type in On the Objective and we'll come up on those platforms. So uh, as, a, as a last word, I pray that you would be encouraged and blessed and edified by our discussion here today and that God's Holy Spirit would rest upon you and give you the discernment that you need to make the right decisions about what to do with your time um, and just how to act and how to approach the Lord in this generation. There is a, there's a harvest out there that is incredible, even in even Even in my generation that seems to be so far away from God, there's still a cry for meaning, for purpose, for um, for some transcendent uh, value to life and to the decisions that we make. People are adrift, and they haven't even heard the gospel, even here in America, in, in many different cases. So I pray that you would share this broadcast, that you would connect us with someone who needs to hear this word. And thanks again to Pastor Langford for joining us on The Objective. We really do appreciate your time and that you've decided to spend uh, some of it here with us and pray that uh, God would bless you and that he would keep you uh, this day and every day. So thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time on The Objective. There ain't no grave can hold my body down. There ain't no grave can hold my body down. When I hear that trumpet sound, I'm going to rise right out of the ground. There ain't no grave can hold my body down. 